Welcome and thank you for attending today's session of Lexby's eDiscovery webinar series, Best Practices Managed Review, presented by Black Letter Discovery Managing Partner Bob Roberts. The purpose of our eDiscovery webinar series is to discuss technologies, concepts, and processes as they relate to emerging large-scale eDiscovery and litigation document management needs. Today's webinar should last about 20 minutes and we'll have a URL to access a recorded version of the presentation available to anyone who registered later this week. If during our webinar uh, there are any questions that you have or any technical issues being experienced, please email them to webinars at lexby.com. To give you a brief back background of Black Letter Discovery, uh, BLD provides large-scale document review and discovery solutions and expertise to law firms and corporate legal departments nationwide. At Lexby, we develop technology that helps litigation professionals meet tight discovery deadlines and deliver these solutions through the Lexby eDiscovery platform. And uh, before I think, hand things over, uh, let me tell you a bit about Bob. Uh, as mentioned, Bob is the managing partner at Black Letter Discovery and has a wealth of experience comprehensively directing managed reviews. Bob also has spent time in civil prosecution and also in private practice in state and federal courts in Ohio. We are truly thankful to have Bob with us today to share his insights and approach to large-scale discovery. And with that, here is Bob Roberts uh, with Best Practices Managed Document Reviews. I just wanted to uh, thank Stu for the kind introduction and to thank the, the good folks at Lexby for including us in, in their eDiscovery e -discovery webinar series. We're, we're, we're happy to be here. And uh, then to all the attendees, thank you for taking time out of what I'm sure is your extremely busy schedule to learn a little bit more about best practices with Manage Review. So um, if you take a look here, this is our uh, roadmap of what we, what we intend to cover today. Um, first and foremost, what is a managed review? What is the importance? Why is it important to, important to conduct an efficient review? Uh, we'll take a look at traditional staffing versus managed review and then dive in a little bit deeper with best practices for project management, leadership and staffing, review process design, quality control, integration and communication with counsel, reporting, and then uh, a very high level discussion of uh, peer review and logging. So what is a managed review? Uh, on a high level, managed review involves sourcing external facilities, resources, and legal personnel to staff and manage large scale document reviews. Uh, it allows law firms and corporate clients to take advantage of on-demand facilities, expert project managers, and highly efficient review teams to deliver high-quality, defensible, and cost-effective document reviews. Now, I know that sounds like a bunch of uh, jargon, but we'll dive uh, deeper into uh, each of these concepts throughout the presentation. So wh why is it important to have an efficient review? Uh, back in 2013, the RAND Corporation conducted a study of the cost of e-discovery by phase, and this is a visual, visual representation of what they found. And essentially, what they found was 73% or 73 cents on every dollar that was spent on a large-scale e-discovery project went to review. So what that means practically is that any, uh, anything that you can do to run more efficiently and to save time and therefore money will have a huge impact. Uh, on, with respect to the review process, it's going to have a, a huge impact uh, on your overall budget for that matter. And obviously, across multiple matters, it, it can be exemplified. So taking a look at a traditional staffing, and what I mean by that is either uh, staffing a, inside a law firm with the law firm's own personnel or outside a law firm, uh, I'm sorry, still inside the law firm physically but uh, using contract attorneys. Uh, traditional uses and applications of those were, were, they were good for small teams with basic tasks, easy coding decisions to be made, uh, linear workflows where you, you know, start a document one and go through document 100,000 or however many there may be in the collection. Uh, and it was also easier to do when, when law firms had robust and available firm resources, which, um, as most of us know, uh, that there, there's law firms are, as most businesses, are having to run leaner and leaner, and so those resources may no longer be there. Some of the inefficiencies and pitfalls that we've seen with, with traditional review is there's a reporting structure ambiguity. And what we mean by that is um, if you have different contract attorneys associates independently reviewing and they have a question, they may not know where to go with that question to get their you know, to get an answer. Uh, they may not know who they're supposed to be reporting to or, 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 you know, if there's a change in guidance, you know, trickling it down to the members of the team takes a while. Uh, if you don't do this every day, I, I, can, I can personally uh, attest that it's difficult to scale up and, and deploy a large team of attorneys quickly. I mean, between the, the, the desk, tables, chairs, computers, um, 
email addresses. Uh, it's a very time-consuming process, and, and uh, it's difficult to do uh, internally inside a law firm. Um, you find that there's less specialized or no QC processes in place, and we'll get into why that's important a little bit down the road, and uh, little or no communication between reviewers. So, you know, there's multiple models, but you could have everyone in their own offices in a law firm, uh, independently not speaking with each other. You could have contract attorneys in a single room, but not necessarily being uh, encouraged to talk to each other, or um, remote people logging in from home, um, where they, they are just sort of on an island and, and unable to, to communicate with the other reviewers. And so what you find is, if they can't uh, interact with each other, each of them could very well be coding uh, inconsistently, independently, thinking they're doing the right thing and having no idea whether they are or not. And so obviously, all of these issues can lead to inefficient and exp uh, expensive engagement. So some of the benefits of managed review as, as opposed to traditional staffing is you have on-demand scalable attorney review teams. We're able to add and subtract attorneys as necessary to meet budgetary guidelines or, or um, obviously litigation or subpoena response deadlines to make sure at a moment's notice that we can, we can hit the mark and, and, and deliver on, on whatever our client's expectations are. Uh, expert project management, typically what you find with, with, with most managed review companies and, and I would highly recommend using ones that have full-time uh, project managers. That, that, that It's what they do. Uh, we have excellent project managers, and it's their sole focus, so they, they've become extremely, uh, their expertise is, is wide. Um, you have secure state-of-the-art review facilities, uh, probably across the nation, certainly across uh, some companies and, and across multiple time zones, which you can take advantage of. You have high-performance computers and internet connectivity to make sure that you can uh, that amount of people working and uh, you know, drawing on the same bandwidth to make sure that you, you don't have a lag uh, as you continue coding. Payroll, which uh, doesn't seem like a big, <laughs> big deal on paper, but when you're dealing with 50, 100 you know, or more attorneys that need to get paid, um, attorneys or, or JDs or, or paralegals or whoever it may be, um, it, it, it can be cumbersome and, and that's all traditionally taken care of by a manager review company. And then uh, obviously HR issue resolution, which what we mean by that is since they are our employees, if anything uh, rises from a, an HR perspective, obviously we would, we would deal with that. So what are the goals of project management? So the main goal, obviously, uh, is to create and implement a review plan that conforms to the needs of the client, um, which sounds easier than it really is in practice because, uh, one, you know, they can, they can change over the course of the review, and two, um, you may not necessarily know as you dive into a review what the ultimate goal is. Uh, you know, if it's a government investigation, you don't know what you're going to find. Um, you need to be flexible and, and, and uh, able to change on the fly. Uh, but as far as the best practice to, to, to do that, um, you know, very, very early on, trying to do your best to identify the scope of the review. What are the reviewers going to be asked to do? How many issue tags will there be? Um, are they going to be, or, you know, they're going to be privacy or privilege redactions, priv logging, uh, what are the project timelines, you know, uh, is there is there a production deadline we're talking about, uh, what, what's the, what are the budgetary constraints, uh, what QC plans, quality control plans will they want, will, will the law firm want to implement themselves, which ones will they want us to do, how do they want us to communicate with them, should we, you know, early on we suggest, uh, you know, at least a, a weekly call, if not a daily call after we get training and up to speed to make sure that we're touching base daily to get updated guidance and keeping the team uh, informed. So, so I guess the takeaway there is spending some time early on to the extent that you can. I mean, I know we're all busy and um, it's hard to get people to, to, to uh, plan until something's right in front of them. But the, any amount of time that you can spend planning these things out, trying to really accurately scope the review, it really helps you right-size the team and understand what the expectations are and then therefore you're much better able to meet those expectations as the review progresses. Uh, another goal of project management is to uh, streamline communication between service providers, counsel, and the review team, which again I think in theory sounds simple, but when you have multiple people that can be involved in a project at, on the e-discovery processing hosting side, uh, you have um, one or two, maybe multiple outside counsel, and uh, you have the review team, which is represented through the project manager. There's a lot of uh, people that, that need to be kept in the loop and, and informed as you go through um, a review. So what we try to do very early on is create a review process team, uh, which would be uh, a representative, one representative from you know, any and all e-discovery service providers, 
uh, one main counsel that's going to be responsible for running the review ideally. And then the review team, again, is represented through the project manager, which is the single point of contact for the entire review team. So outside counsel has access to one person who's going to be able to keep the team informed. And instead of having to field questions from multiple attorneys, again, either remotely or in the same place or in different offices, which very frequently you find that they would ask the same questions, you're getting one question from one person who tries to put it in a way that makes sense and it's easy to answer. Uh, and then the ultimate goal is obviously to maximize the quality and defensibility of the review while you're minimizing the cost. So um, in order to do so, you want to adhere to QC and, and your document review best practices that you've, you've uh, learned over time. And the project manager then is also uh, responsible for managing and optimizing reviewer accuracy and productivity. And we'll get into how that's done in just a second here. So when you talk about leadership and staffing uh, for a managed review, um, what you want to do is, oh, my apologies, what you want to do is obviously leverage the expertise of experienced project managers and reviewers, implement appropriate staffing levels based on project needs, budget, and timelines, and you want to assemble and maintain an appropriately trained and qualified review team. I mean, obviously, you want to put together the best team you can uh, based on their background, their, your, their prior performance with your company, and what the expectations are for this review. So some of our best practices, what we try to do is deploy great reviewers versus great resumes. Now, uh, that is not to say that we don't have very high pedigree reviewers that are extremely impressive on paper, um, and we, we love to work with them. But, but what we really are looking for are people that, that want to do the work, that have a great attention to detail, a great attitude, and they're going to work hard for us. Um, so, so, you know, we don't only judge our reviewers based on, on their resume alone. In addition, uh, because we're a managed review company, and I think this goes for all managed review companies, they, you know, they come into our facility, we're able to work with them and train them and you know, teach them the best practices that we've learned over the course of multiple reviews and, and, and put them in a position to be successful. Um, another uh, aspect of this is, is maintaining a, a very large uh, network of skilled document review professionals. And again, since we work with them in, under our roof, we, we, we get to learn the strengths and weaknesses of our teams and, and uh, know who, who, we, who will be better suited towards which engagements. But you also need a very, very deep pool of talented attorneys because you don't know um, what your, uh, how many people you're going to need on a given, on a given day, uh, even across individual projects. I mean, they can ramp up and ramp down pretty quickly. So um, we are constantly interviewing. We, have, uh, we do in-person interviews. And um, I think it, that that's a big aspect, too, having in-person interviews, making sure that you speak with people and, and get a feel for, for their attention to detail and uh, and who they are as people. And then uh, maintaining this large network will allow you to quickly scale up and scale down uh, review centers across one review center, or if the company has multiple, multiple, again, to maybe optimize multiple time zones, or foreign language reviewers, or, or whatever the case may be. So with respect to review process design, um, when we were talking about the, the traditional staffing model, uh, where, where there were traditionally linear workflows, start at doc one, go through doc 100,000 or 10,000 or whatever the number may be, um, we very, very rarely see that anymore. And frankly, we work with our clients to, to not do that because um, it's rare to find a review where that, that always makes sense. I mean, there's, there's, there's going to be uh, things that need to be reviewed and things that don't need to be reviewed uh, in, any, in any given collection. And, and our goal is to review what we need to review and, and, and not review what we don't need to do. So, you want to design a workflow process that optimizes the quality and efficiency of the review, but then also making sure that you're reviewing everything that you need to, um, but not much more. So some of the best practices that we've done, and again, this is, uh, I mean, you could have a laundry list here, but, but it depends on, um, you know, the needs of the matter, you know, who, who's, who's asking for the information, what are they asking for. So this is just some best practices on a very high level, uh, things that we do to try to optimize uh, reviews and, and be a little more efficient. Uh, efficient, excuse me. Um, we can organize by custodians, the by custodians, the most important custodians that you think are going to have the most relevant information. Uh, you can look at date restrictions. Obviously, a lot of the platforms you can you, uh, filter out certain domains, uh, internet addresses, to make sure you're not getting fantasy football updates. Um, we apply privilege filters. I'll get into that when we talk a little bit about privilege in a little bit. Um, some of the platforms can actually identify near duplicate or conceptual document groupings. Uh, the, the purpose of that is to put similar looking and subject 
similar documents into one reviewer's queue, so that reviewer becomes an expert on that issue or that concept, and then they're therefore able to move much more efficiently through those uh, that those document regroupings. And then similarly, uh, email th threading, what that is, is the technology can locate all of the different people who may be involved in electronic email communication. Uh, and if they forward it to different people without copying everybody else, the technology is able to pull all of those separate conversations into one conversation. Uh, so you're not spending time reviewing each and every email. Uh, and you know, one reviewer could be reviewing one email, and then another reviewer could be reviewing another one, and they'll have different pieces of the conversation without really knowing what, what it's all about. Um, so, so we love to use that, uh, that technology when it's available to us. Keyword highlighting, uh, when you're looking in, a, uh, in the actual viewer of a review platform, uh, search terms traditionally and uh, ideally privileged terms with two different colors would be highlighted. So it would draw the reviewer's eye and they're able to take a look uh, at the document, get a sense of the words, that, why these documents were pulled into the collection, and if it was really for the purpose that um, that council intended. Uh, obviously, we all know that search terms are an imperfect thing, an imperfect thing, and um, so so th that's the purpose of the highlighting. And then privilege highlighting, uh, we'll, we'll talk about when we get into privilege. But but those are those are very useful for the review team to move efficiently. And uh, again, privilege review, and, and, and uh, I guess what, what makes sense to talk about here before privilege is uh, running multiple phases of the same review at the same time. Uh, so, so you start with the review team, and, and um, it turns out that you're going to have to redact certain information, whether it be HIPAA information or, again, privileged information or uh, quality assurance privilege. But whatever information the client does not want to be produced to the other party, you'll have to redact it. And um, so what we'll do is, and then you'll also potentially have to do some privilege review and priv priv logging. So we'll have multi-tiered frequently uh, reviews where one, one team is doing first level review as a big enough pool gets up of documents needing redaction, well, we can segregate, put another team on redactions that's very good at redactions. And then also we can segregate the team even further and uh, have people doing privilege review and priv logging as we're progressing through first level review and they're kind of working off each other. So that way you're, you're able to kind of predict when you'll end your review a little bit better. This is um, uh, basically showing, this is Lexby's uh, layout uh, coding layout, and as you can see uh, with the window popping uh, up on here, it says, on behalf of Jeff Skilling, I believe the name is, and it's highlighted. So in this case, Skilling was likely a, a search term, so, so that draws your eye. You know who the, who the custodian is that, that, that you know, is relevant in this document. But uh, the purpose of the slide is really to, to, to mention that even something as simple as the physical layout of the coding panel uh, can have a big difference on how efficient you are during the course of your review. So we've had you know panels that we've worked with where there's a lot of scrolling and, and you know, multiple issue tags and you have to open different panels, and um, which is not to say it's necessarily a bad thing, but obviously from an efficiency perspective that really slows down your speed, um, and you know you want to move as efficiently as possible and you don't want something like a coding panel uh, slowing you down when you when you're able to make quicker decisions. So quality control. Uh, obviously, what you want to do is, 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 is deliver a work product that is accurate and consistent across the collection. Uh, you want to create procedures that minimize potential errors and coding inconsistencies. And uh, last but certainly not least, you want to make sure you're retaining any privilege claims. So, so some of the best practices for, for quality control is, is to establish, follow, and document uh, quality control protocols that conform to council's needs early, early on. We ourselves uh, traditionally have a four-step QC process that is part of our best practices that we, we would like to implement um, given the opportunity on any review. Um, that's not always possible and, and, and council, outside council may have their own QC process that works well for them and we're certainly uh, able to adapt and, and implement their, uh, their protocols as well. So, but, but I think that the, the takeaway, the best practice is making sure that you early on establish what they are, what they're going to be, you follow them. You definitely follow them clearly, and then you document them later on in case they're ever called into question. We'll get into some case law in a second. Um, you want to identify questions for resolution by outside counsel. The project manager, as we go through our process, is constantly, uh, certainly early on, less so later on, elevating uh, ambiguous documents to the uh, 
to the uh, associate or partner running the, the review for resolution. Um, because, you know, even we get trained, we spend a couple of days on training and, and uh, make sure that we're dialed in on the guidance starting review, but in, inevitably the guidance is going to evolve through the course of the review. And the way that we dial into that guidance is by constantly creating a feedback loop between us being the project manager and then her distributing to the team and then she uh, is, is constantly in contact with outside counsel trying to get as clear a guidance as we can there then to be distributed to the team. Um, another purpose of, you, you know, you want to have a focus removal of all privileged documents from your, your production sets. And even if you're going to not review documents as we alluded to earlier because you think perhaps one custodian is less important than another, uh, it's a good idea to go ahead and, and, and test your assumptions and sample those documents um, and, and to make sure that you're comfortable uh, not reviewing any more of those documents. And you've, and you've, uh, you've taken a look and you've documented that you've taken a look. So again, it's never called into question. There, there's a process there. So this is why this is all important. So, so uh, at least in federal court with respect to uh, Federal Rule of Evidence 502B, um, when you have an in, uh, disclosure of an attorney-client communication, uh, the rule states is not waived if the disclosure was, one, inadvertent, Two, the holder of the privilege took reasonable steps to prevent disclosure. And three, the holder promptly notify, uh, took reasonable steps to rectify the error. I apologize. We probably should have a slide on that. But I, I suspect many of you are familiar with the rule. And where all of this comes into uh, play is the, is the second element, which is the holder of the privilege took reasonable steps to prevent disclosure. So uh, here, here's some case law uh, where they said that, it, where the court ultimately said, you're trying to claw back your documents. You didn't use a reasonable process. Um, so therefore, privilege is waived. These documents get produced, and, and I think uh, I think Stu said that they're going to uh, post these slides and and, and the webinar, uh, or I'm happy to, to to send you any of these sites if you're interested directly. But but um, one of the ones that I found the most interesting uh, is the Kmart Corporation case, where it's one attorney uh, that works for the corporation reviewed the documents um, with an eye towards discovering a work product or attorney-client communications. And they were produced. He filed an affidavit saying that's what he did. And the court said that's not good enough. Uh, he didn't articulate what kind of technology was used, what additional steps he took. Uh, and therefore, privilege was waived. Um, conversely, uh, in the Coburn case, uh, same court two years earlier, um, what they had was a, uh, the party asserting privilege and, and trying to claw back the documents had a detailed protocol and a six-step review process. Uh, that the court that was articulated to the court, the court understood, uh, and and then therefore held that the privilege wasn't waived, and they could therefore claw back the documents. I mean, ideally, you know, these documents don't get out, but if they do, this is the way that the court's going to look at it. So you really want to make sure you have a process in place, uh, and that you can articulate clearly what the process was. So you want it to be a repeatable, defensible uh, process. Integration with outside counsel. Uh, this goes along with reporting, which we'll, we'll get into next. But um, you want to maintain consistent, open, and direct communication channels with counsel and provide clear instructions for review teams as guidance evolves. So we kind of touched on a lot of this earlier, so I, I won't belabor any of the points. But um, you know, you want to set an, uh, you want to set a, a um, uh, communication schedule very early on, and you want to adhere to it. You want to make sure that that as things come up, you don't continue to bump it out and bump it out, so that you never actually have the conversation and determine you know get the guidance that you're looking for. Um, you want to test early stage review results with counsel's input. But we do that all the time after after they've trained us in person, ideally, or, or over the phone. Again, we're constantly um, elevating novel documents to make sure that we are dial we're dialed in to to their guidance as the review evolves, and then we document that guidance. That's cr a crucial step uh, that I would highly recommend because uh, one, you don't want to forget it because you're likely to find uh, additional documents like this down the road. But more importantly. You, this, you create a document you can share with the team. We call it our decision log. Um, as decisions are made, we, we, we elevate a document, we ask a novel question, we get a response from counsel, we incorporate it into a document, we then send it back to counsel and say, is this you, the guidance as you understand it? Once that's confirmed, we share it with our team. So throughout the process, in this iterative process, the, our teams have the most updated guidance that is coming straight from counsel. So, um, it, 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 it's it, it, again, so it's 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 informing our our reviewers regarding um, evolving guidance, but it's also a defensibility trail for uh, the law firm and the client, showing the decisions that were made throughout the course of review. And if any, if any of them come into question again, it can be 
hold, that, that's a, a resource that you have down the road uh, to try to track down the answers. Um, so uh, also with reporting, that this kind of goes along with uh, integration and communication with council, but um, what you want to do, since this is not taking place uh, most of the time in your outside council or client's facility, you really need to make sure that you're keeping them up to date. Uh, you want to give them up-to-date, consistent, and immediately available progress and quality control reports. Um, I, I know at Black Letter we send a daily report that summarizes the, the progress of the review from with respect to the day before, not only the day before, but where we stand overall, any key statistics that they want us to measure, uh, the number of document, documents reviewed by each reviewer per hour, the team uh, aggregate per hour, uh, completion estimate rates, which you, which you can use to test your budget to make sure that you're, you're, you're staying on budget throughout the course of the review, and then graphs showing productivity trends. So again, we, we send a report every single day that shows where we are in the review, and not only that, what tags are being used, what you know, how many documents are being tagged relevant versus not relevant, and privileged versus not privileged, and then what, you know, you, you set up the issue tags thinking you know what issues are going to be discussed most frequently in documents, but once you get in there, you'd be surprised. And so we track the issue tags to see what the documents are really talking about. And then the council can make informed decisions um, with respect to how they may want to change that or change the review as we, as we move along uh, the course of the review. Uh, again, uh, your goal is to track budget, and, and these reports are, go, go a long way towards doing that. Uh, that being said, where possible, you absolutely want to leverage review software to automatically generate the progress reports, because they can be time consuming to put together and uh, some of the platforms out there have a lot of tools you can use to either incorporate it into your own customized tool, I'm sorry, your own customized report, or uh, share it and give access to the clients or outside counsel so they can they can access it on their own and, and in real time they can they can check in and see where everything stands. Um, the last thing you want to do for reporting is uh, is have a final defensibility report, no matter if you call it your final report or or, or uh, which is traditionally what we would call ours. And what we do is we we it's a document that kind of gives a narrative overview of what we've done and then includes all the reports we've been talking about, the decision log, the um, productivity reports, daily productivity reports, our daily diary that, that, that covers the course of the review. All of the reports that we put together, um, all of these things, you know, two, three years down the road, all of them are likely to be forgotten. So what we do is we put it all together in one place in our final report to make sure that, again, if any of this is called in question down the road, hopefully it's not, you have a, a, a resource at your fingertips. Uh, that we, we have successfully used in the past to, to, to pinpoint you know, and get some, some uh, questions answered. So this is what it looks like uh, when we're talking about automating the, the, the reporting process. This is again Lexby and they have a dynamic uh, review track and report that allows you to evaluate the productivity in real time. So as the reviewers are, are uh, and, and we've used this tool uh, at Black Letter, and um, so, so as, as, they, as our reviewers are um, coding, you know, these statistics and these metrics are filling in so we can actually see what the productivity looks like. And again, um, we would either export this, in, you know, and incorporate it into our own document. We can filter on different different aspects of the review that we want to focus on. And then just, you know, make sure that we uh, customize our report to make sure, you know, we're, we're reporting as frequently as the client wants real solid uh, numbers. This is another one where, again, reports should easily and instantly identify status and progress of the review. And then, so privilege review and logging, uh, it's funny, I've, I've spoken with, with Gene uh, at Lexby about this a couple times, and it literally could be its own, uh, its own webinar. So, so uh, I intend to speak about it on a, on a, on a very, very high level. But so, so what your goal is uh, with privilege review and logging is you only want to include responsive and non privileged documents. And you want to avoid waiver. We sort of went into the way to do that. You want to focus on your process, make sure it is um, th th that you have a process and that it is uh, uh, you're able to articulate what was done. But one of the other things that we do, um, just from a workflow and process design standpoint, uh, very early on, where the clients are amenable to it, we'll we'll screen the data early and we'll break them off into two groups of documents. So if, if a lot of times, uh, as everybody knows, you, you have not only responsiveness uh, keywords, but privilege keywords, and as we spoke about with the highlighting. But while also you can use them to segregate the documents into different batches. So when you start the review, um, you, you, we, you, we tend to start with the 
documents that do not have privilege hits, which from our point of view would be presumptively privileged. So this is not to say we don't consider for, we don't consider privilege on documents that don't have a privilege review hit. We do, um, but they are not considered presumptively privileged. We're just trying to identify privilege, which allows our reviewers to get up to speed on the protocol and the tagging structure and the substance of the case. Um, so they're focusing on what's responsive versus what's not responsive and the issues in the case versus grappling with what are what are uh, much more difficult privilege decisions that you that you probably want somebody with a little more specialized knowledge making final determinations. So what we'll do is split it again, uh, first level review into two, uh, in, into two phases, and in, in not only two groups but two phases. So uh, as we review the two groups on the first level review, anything with any indicia of privilege, we would kick into a bucket called possibly privileged or potentially privileged. That way, those reviewers are able to move through the collection efficiently without having to grapple with those issues and having them get bogged down in the details and slow down. Then what you're able to do is, is have a much, much, much smaller collection for second level review that will be conducted either by highly trained um, uh, contract reviewers uh, or, or, or by the law firm. We've seen it done both ways. And then uh, also we can work with the, the, the clients to create priv logs. And um, uh, so this is just reiterating what we just went over. Um, we'll talk about privilegging in a second, uh, briefly. But but so so first level review again. We just want to spot potential privilege issues, any indicia of privilege, kick it into a bucket for second level review. And then for second level review, a specialized training, and um, make sure that we're dialed in with whoever's making decisions with respect to whether a document is privileged or not. Make sure we're really dialed in on their guidance, uh, because as we all know, um, some attorneys take an extremely broad view with respect to privilege and some take a very narrow view. So making sure that we understand what view um, counsel wants us to take and that we're, we're, we're dialed in to the guidance that he or she wants us to understand. Uh, spending the time to do that early on, get retrained, calibrate, and, and then move forward to the process. Still on calls, I mean, on any review there's going to be very, very difficult calls to be made on privilege and then what we would typically do is um, Obviously, we try to resolve them on our own, but if, if, they're, if they're too close to call, we elevate those to counsel uh, to, to have them make the, the final decision. With respect to um, putting together priv privilege logs, um, which is obviously where you document you know, uh, the type of document you withheld under what theory and, and, and who it was from and that sort of thing, um, what we are able to work with, with technology providers and outside counsel to, to one, uh, put together priv logs, but then also optimize uh, and leverage the, the, the technology to do it and automate it in a way so we're not just sitting there doing data entry into an Excel spreadsheet, which could take uh, a very, very long time. So this is, again, as an example from Lexby that shows some of the metadata fields that they have that can be exported into an Excel sheet and customized to automate as much of that as possible and then have actual reviewers go through and QC and make sure, obviously in connection with counsel and getting guided from counsel all the way through, uh, to make sure that, that you're getting the guidance and, and the log as tight as possible with as few you know, uh, typos and errors and that sort of thing. So that's, that's, the, main, that's the main thrust of the, of the, of the uh, webinar today. Um, in summary, managed review allows you to leverage on-demand people and facilities, expert leadership, proven quality uh, control processes, best of breed review technology and then defensible workflows so that you have a, a highly cost effective, defensible uh, and high quality document review. So um, with that, um, here's my contact information. Uh, I, I know we spoke, uh, kind of blew through this information pretty quickly and um, I'd be happy to, to talk to any of you. Uh, if you have any questions or you want to take a deeper dive on any of the stuff we discussed, I'd be more than happy to talk with you. So. Please don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, in closing, I just wanted to say thank you again uh, to Stu and the folks at Lexby. Thank you for, for having me as part of the webinar series. And, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you.